Okay, hi guys. So thank you for showing up to my talk. Yeah, it's great. Um, so my name is Niklas Schelin. Uh, I'm actually from Sweden. And I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna introduce myself a little bit quickly. That's not really what we're gonna talk about, but I'm an independent uh, security consultant. So I help different companies to build better software security-wise. Uh, one project I particularly worked on lately was transferring physical keys to digital keys for, for facility management, for example. So kind of always ended up in some sort of PKI situation. And that's really what we're going to be talking about. Uh, but we're going to be looking at PKIs when we lift them up into the application and start taking the whole responsibility and using that to secure our applications. Um, I did have a little clicker here. I'll go with that. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a little question. So what, what do you guys think is the basic concept or thing you need in order to create a secure infrastructure? What is really needed? Any ideas? Encryption. Encryption is good. I mean, that is, that's a tool we're going to be using. I'm lo looking for more of a, a concept here. Trust, trust. trust is, is the right answer. Because if we, we, we can put any encryption in there, we can put security controls. If we don't have trust, it doesn't really matter because the entities then can't really talk to each other securely. But yeah, encryption is part of it. I mean, that's really how we're going to seal the trust at some point. So just a quick sort of, I'm not going to talk too much about the public key infrastructure is just a quick introduction. So we know a little bit. Um, so it starts off with a public key. And as we all know, behind every public key, there is a stronger uh, uh, private or sometimes it's referred to as a secret key. And that forms a public key pair. Nothing weird about that. That's just, you know, how we build these the PKIs. And then we can put them into different types of structures. So one of them is this hierarchical PKI, which is, I guess, the most common one where you have a tree looking structure uh, with a root that is based on your trust. And then you start to sort of issue other public keys uh, within this uh, to create these intermediate nodes. And then finally, at some point, you're going to have leaf nodes. And that's going to be your, your devices, your end nodes, your users, whatever it is. So this is a classic certificate authority kind of style thing for domain names, for example, to build trust within those kind of systems. And we have another uh, structure that is known as the web of trust. And this was the PGP kind of style um, thing that was created at the same time. So here really uh, every node, every public key is their own root. So you kind of create that and then you, you issue that, you send that over to your friends, whoever, and you start to build this kind of uh, web, which doesn't look this, normally doesn't look this structure, it's more like a spaghetti web, but uh, this is the idea. So you get a direct trust for those who might sign your keys, but with that you get an ind indirect trust for everyone else that they may have signed in turn. Um, so this is the basics, and now we're going to look at an open source project that is kind of lifting this kind of thinking up into the application. It is called Dime. Uh, and it, it kind of introduced a concept called application-based public key infrastructure. Nothing weird with that, it's just where it's placed. Normally PKI lives a little bit further down into the platform. Uh, so here's the Dime Dragon. You have to have a cool icon, I guess. Uh, Dime stands for Data Integrity Message Envelope. And that kind of explains everything, but I'm still going to go through it though. Uh, so it has a trust-based security module. So that's really the PKI where it comes in. It's using that. It has a modern data format. So it's, the inspiration here is a lot of JWT and that kind of thinking, where JSON is, is used. Uh, but one of the primary uh, principles to, for the design of this has been human readable. Uh, it, it needs to be easy for developers to read it so they can troubleshoot, they can find things. It shouldn't actually work against them, it should work with them. Because when you start to involve cryptography and things like that, things do tend to get a little bit more complicated. Uh, less options, very important. Because we don't have time to learn everything. So 
when we need to take decisions of what to use, we tend to make mistakes. So if we don't have to take too many decisions, then that could be a way of actually increasing security in our applications. Open and transparent is a very important factor. If you're building a PKI, you need to know what's going on all the way down. There shouldn't be any black boxes because then you can't really say that we trust this. So that, that's a very important and it's, of course it's free. You can download and use it and that's a bonus. So what, what does it contain like? I don't know if you're probably not supposed to really read this table anyway, but it's based on claims and we all know claims. Claims are used in JWT, uh, in OAuth2 and so forth. Uh, so it basically builds up entities through that and then package that into some sort of items. And there are a couple of different items. And this is just a few examples. So you would have key items. Uh, they would wrap keys together. Uh, it could be public key pairs, so it could be encryption keys or something like that. Uh, you would have ad identities, which is a bit like certificates. Same thing, it kind of holds lots of claims about the holder or the owner of the subject. Uh, they could be signed. Well, most items here could be signed. Uh, messages, that's how you would be sending data back and forth between your application. Uh, so you can put application-based uh, payloads in there that's specific for your application. And then that's all wrapped up into some sort of envelope. And that's integrity protection and, and, uh, and it gives you that kind of trust model all wrapped into one. So basically similar, like you take paper uh, sheets and you put that into a paper envelope and you seal that. So that's the idea. So it kind of looks like this. This is a dime item. And maybe it doesn't apparently stick anything out that you can look and read this, but there are a couple of things already at this level. Uh, so you would have a, a header up here, very simple. So all dime envelopes starts with DI. So you recognize this is a dime envelope. And then the colon there does actually say that there's an item coming up. So it could be m multiple items in here. And if there was a second one, there would have been a colon at the end here, and that will be the next item coming up. Uh, and the ID is the header of the item. That just really stands for it's an identity. So if it were a key, you would say key and so forth. So already here, you, you can read a couple of things. But then you have a section down here, which is actually the signature. So that's, that's protecting the integrity of, of the rest of the data set. Uh, but the interesting thing here is actually this middle part, the gray, and I'm sure you really already understand that this is base64. So if you decode this, which most modern text editors can do that for you uh, today, you will actually get this JSON. And there's a couple of things in here. This was an identity. So you would see there's the claims and there's a cap. That means capabilities. So that kind of explains what this identity can do. Uh, there's, it says self in there, and self really means that this identity has been created by the same person who created the public key. Uh, so it's a self-issued identity. So if it was issued by someone else, the word self wouldn't be in there. There's some expiration dates, some, some issue that dates, and they're all readable. There are RFC 3339 uh, internet date formats. So they're easy to parse, but they're also easy to read. Uh, there's a public key. There is um, also a system there. It says LASCON 2022. Uh, and that's just the system you're building. So there's a name for it. So you can, you can use that for different purposes, but it's really to show where, where your identity belongs to. So that's how it looks like. But what are we trying to actually solve here? Uh, so this is the OWASP top 10 from last year. So that's the latest update. Uh, so these are actually things that goes wrong out there. And if you just highlight this second one, it's called cryptographic failures. Uh, and also pulled off like how to pre prevent this from the OWASP website. Uh, so the ones in green, they are um, related to using cryptography wrongly. You know, the algorithms, just the par parameters that we may need or when to use it, or just using the wrong one or the old one or something like that. And this is actually a problem. Uh, and my theory here is that the problem is actually 
the base, uh, the, the base that it's actually cheap to use. You can download things. You can get it from the platform. All, all operating systems have something you can use, or libraries have something to use, or languages, whatever frameworks. But actually knowing how is a little bit more expensive. So you need to spend time. You need to, to educate yourself. I'm sure you guys, you paid to come here, or someone paid for you. You may travel and spend time and so forth. And that's actually gaining more knowledge. You know, you're learning things, you're, you're getting knowledge, uh, but it costs. But you could stay at home and you can download an algorithm or whatever open source, and that's pretty much free. So that's one of the, the problems with particularly this usage of cryptography. It is slightly difficult to get it right. Uh, so I'm just an example of that. So choosing algorithms. So X509 is the data format for certificates. So that's the standard format for that. Uh, it was designed sometime in the late 80s. It's using abstract uh, syntax notation version 1 uh, as a data format, which was also just, uh, created sometime mid-80s, I think, uh, which is a great format for complex structures, but not so great for people to read. Um, and that's one of the problems we're working with that. I personally have worked with the format. And those digits there and within the brackets, that's how you specify an algorithm. So, you know, mistyping that, you could get something else. And that's not just for algorithms, that's for anything else you want to do. And this is a subset that you kind of explains the digital signatures that are available. And we just look at that a couple of ones there. Uh, I'm sure all, all in here knows that MD5 should not be used for anything that is remotely trying to call itself secure. But if you didn't know that, you could be selecting the wrong one. And SHA-1 is pretty much the same. Uh, so how about the more modern formats like JWT? Well, they, they, they have made this a lot better, but they introduced a couple of things that may not actually make it better. Uh, I'm not arguing against the use of none because there could be very good reasons to use none. Uh, but I've seen actually uh, from my personal experience that developers tend to use none early on in the project because maybe they haven't set up the rest for using the keys and handling all that. And they work in an agile fashion. So things will fall into place at some point in the project. Once they get to the production, it's all fine. But some assumptions, some checks, some things that should have been there may not have made it to production and they kind of assume that none is okay. Then of course, none did cause a little bit of problem a few years back because libraries parsed none as it was okay and didn't inform. So you could strip the signature off a of JWT and that would be fine. Uh, so there was plenty of vulnerabilities a few years ago uh, with JWT. But just have a look at this one here, which says RSA uh, SSA, PSS using SHA-256 and MGF1 with SHA-256. You know, what does that actually say? You, you have to understand what this is. If you say, okay, are this going to solve my problem? Um, it, 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 it is actually a good combination, a good algorithm, but you're going to have to spend a day Googling it or trying to figure it out. Uh, so. JWT is full of options. There are so many things you can use and set. So just knowing what to choose is a problem. So in Dyne, what do we do then? Well, when we get to the point where you suppose, okay, let's choose the algorithms or things like that, it's actually already done. You don't have to worry about it because it works in suites. So there's a couple of different usages that is needed for doing certain operations, uh, and they're all selected already. So these algorithms here, maybe someone recognized them because they're actually part of Sodium. Uh, sodium was made famous by Daniel Bernstein and his friends when they actually develop it. And they had a similar idea behind that uh, library because they wanted to make something that was easy to use, something that could be 
used better and less mistakes. And those kind of ideas is, is, is shared with the concept of this dime. Uh, so it's trying to make it a little bit better. So I would say it solves one out of two problems. Uh, the problem it solves is that you don't have to worry about making a choice because someone else that knew how to use it has already done it. Uh, the problem it may not solve is your knowledge. You still don't know maybe how to use it correctly. But I would say, you know, one out of two is better than none. And there was no pun intended for JWT there. But um, so, so that's what we're trying to solve. But what we're trying to achieve with it, well, if we take a common scenario, we have two entities that are going to be talking to each other. These could be devices, applications, users, whatever. And they want to send sensitive data in between each other. And they usually do that across some sort of untrusted network, which most of the time is the internet. And at that point, you don't, probably don't want anyone to be able to read your data. So what you do is that you put TLS terminators on either end. So you start setting up a TLS uh, tunnel for, over HTTPS. That's going to take care of your encryption. It's going to take of your, care of your trust, the handshake and everything. Uh, so you don't have to worry about it. But the problem is, of course, that little gap in between the TLS terminator and your application. Now, that could be a problem or not. It really depends on how much you trust your network, how much you trust your cloud provider, or whoever is hosting your environment. Uh, or it could actually be a regulatory problem. Let's say there could be no data being sent in clear text between any machine. Um, because what happens is that it terminates, TLS terminate terminates the trust and the encryption. So usually you can trust that, but what if we actually extended that and encapsulated the whole thing and said, well, we're just going to put another layer in there and say that application is going to do this themselves. So if it's TLS underneath or whatever, that's great because we want to work in uh, security in layers. But if it isn't, then it's no problem because we already have another solution running. Uh, so in a way, we're creating an end-to-end -end encryption and trust model here, some sort of e to e t or something. And that's what we're trying to achieve. And how, how do we actually do this? Well, I, I was going through those two PKI uh, models at the beginning. So I'm just going to go through web of trust in three steps, how you set that up using Dyn. And that's, of course, the three steps is from zero to two. Uh, so you have two keys. I have a key, my friend has a key. We both signed our keys ourselves, so we have a signature on that. But I want to start to uh, use that to, to prove trust to someone else. So I ask my friend to sign my key, first step. So I get another signature from him on my key. And then a stranger comes along who also has a key. Uh, and I want to prove my trust to this person. So one thing has to happen before, which is step zero. So my friend also had to sign my, uh, the stranger's key as well. There can be different setups here, but in this case, uh, my friend is signing both. That means that this stranger also has a public key in his uh, key ring, which is just the storage area locally where there are keys that he's trusting. And then I can share my key with this person in the final step, and he can verify that signature from my friend and say, OK, well, this is actually someone I trust to sign this key, so therefore I can uh, perhaps trust his key as well. So it's a very, very simple setup. This could be make it complicated, but, but this is the basis of it. So I just want to highlight one thing here. There's a TOEFL moment. And I'm going to explain what TOEFL is, but I'm just going to leave it right now. So you remember that there's a TOEFL moment when I share my public key with my friend. Uh, the code for doing this in Dime, so there are reference implementations of Dime. This is Java. Uh, so what I would do is that I would generate the key. I'll give it the capability, which is sign, because I want the signing key. Then I'll just uh, do a public copy of it. So I, that kind of extracts only the public key. And I'll sign that with my uh, pr uh, private key, with my original key. 
and I'll export that in a DIME encoded format. So this is all I have to do, and then I'll send that over to my friend. My friend will just import it, sign it with his key, and then do a, a export again. They'll send that back to me, and I'm all happy about that. But I could also share that with a stranger, and they will import that. And now they just call verify on this key that they imported. And that's going to go down into their key ring and see, OK, well, it checks out with this key that you're trusting. So we'll send back this integrity state of complete and say, say this can be trusted. Everything looks fine from dates to, to signatures and so on. So this, this is really the code you'll be using for, for doing that previous slide that I had. Sure, there's going to be plenty of things happening in between. You're going to have to send the key and so forth. But that could be email, that could be a REST API, that could be anything. So looking at the hierarchical PKI in the same way. So here we would have a trusted identity on one end, which is the basis for our trust tree. And I want to be part of that. So I create a key again, but I create something else here. I create something known as an identity issuing request which is very similar to a certificate signing request. So it's basically where I put all my claims in there and I put my public key and I signed that myself. So this is what I would want to have in an identity when it's issued by this uh, trusted identity side here. So this is going to be in uh, six steps from minus one to four. So first step is that. Uh, and then I'll just send over this request to this trusted identity. And they will verify that and they'll send uh, an identity back to me with their signature on it. So now I'm all of a sudden part of that trusted chain. And then we have a stranger coming up as well. And they also have an identity. So same thing as previously, there has to be a step zero. So this has to be signed by this trusted identity as well. So they also have a signature from the same trust chain. Uh, but there needs to be a step minus one as well. So something else has to happen before this, which is the pre-distribution of that trusted identity. So I, in my key ring, will have that so I can verify this stranger and understand if I can trust them. And then once I do that in the final step, uh, it all checks out and I will trust that identity key. So now just imagine all this is happening in an, in an application between two applications and so forth, rather than on some sort of infrastructure level. But again, there's a TOEFL moment, which is when I send my initial request to the trusted identity to be included in the trust chain. We're coming back to that in a slide, but first, and then maybe I have a few developers in here, I guess. So. Just, I don't have dark mode on this, sorry. So just bear with me. But uh, so this is not the code for doing everything in the last slide, but it's, it's just showing uh, how to create that root identity with using the DIME reference implementation. So again, we're creating a key. We give it the capability of sign. Then we need to give capabilities to that identity that we're, we want to use. So in this case, we're just doing an issue. So we want this identity to be able to issue other identities. So it just limits the scope of what we can do with an identity. Uh, we create this identity issuing request, giving it the key. Uh, they will grab the public key from that. And then with uh, the capabilities. Uh, if this was not the route that we were creating, we would take that IRR and send off that to whoever has the trusted identity. That could be our server, our back end, or it could be a different application. Uh, but now we're actually creating the root. So we do a self-issue on this. We give a random U UUID, a GUID. So just as a subject ID, we just need something to refer to. Uh, we get a, put a valid time for one year on there. We put the, our key in because we want to sign with our private key. And we name the system. So in this case, it's just LastCon 2022. So now we actually start to create a system here from a root identity. So how about that TOFU? Anyone have an idea what TOFU stands for? Exactly. So it's trust and first use. And what does that mean? Well, it kind of means this.
Because we don't know. When we get something initially, we have no idea if we can trust that public key coming in. Because it's just a random key we got through an API, through whatever communication means that we're using. Uh, and there are several kind of solutions to this. I'm not going to go through them here, sorry. Uh, because it really depends on what kind of application you're building. Uh, they could be manual, they could be automatic, they could be anything. But the thing I want to emphasize here is if you're building an application-based uh, public key infrastructure into your application, you need to pause at this point. You need to understand how can I trust these public keys coming in through my registration API or however I'm using it. So you need to start to build that kind of thinking from the start. Uh, because once you signed it, once you include it into your tree, it is trusted. And then uh, there is no way back. I mean, you're going to start to have to wor work with revocation chains and things like that. But, but it is, it is, you're sealing the trust from this point on. Um, so a practical example where to use this, how to use this. So we have a setup, which is a cloud service that is connected to an on-premises hub. And the hub itself is connected to a few devices uh, that does different things, some sort of classic IoT setup or something. Uh, and the cloud only talks to the on-premises hub. And the cloud is interested in getting data from this network. So what it would do is that it will create a message, a dime message in this case, where you put instructions in there. And those instructions are completely application specific. That could be anything, any format, any type of instructions or any other type of data for that matter. Um, and then it wants it back end to end encrypted. So you create an exchange key. It'll stick the public key inside the same message here. Uh, I'll sign that with its own identity and send that over to the hub. The hub receives this. It can read it. They can't change it because it's integrity protected. Uh, but it can verify it. And it will do so. And it will create a little tag on top of that with its own signature because it signs that as well. And that tag proves that it's done some sort of operations. It could be it's verified it and checked it out so it makes sense. And then it will send over to whichever device is supposed to get this. And if this device now trusts the uh, on-premises hub, then it only has to verify that tag. It doesn't have to verify everything else. It can if you want to, but it doesn't have to. And sometimes that's preferable to sort of keep verification down to a minimum. So it verifies the tag. And if it's OK with that, it'll start to collect the data that it was supposed to collect from the, from the cloud. Uh, and then it starts to formulate a response coming back. So what, first thing in, in this case, it sticks in its own identity, which is signed by the hub. So it's a hub is actually the one that's issuing it. Uh, and then it takes the data and is going to have to encrypt this. So it creates another exchange key. Uh, it grabs the public key that came down from the exchange from the cloud. And it does a Diffie-Hellman agreement just to create a shared key and encrypts the data and sticks that into a message. Uh, now, that sounds a lot of things to do, but Dime does most of this in the reference implementations. Um, and then it'll do one other special thing here. It will actually create a link between the original request and the response. So now there are, those are tied together. So you can actually verify that this particular response coming back is from my original request. We're gonna, I'm going to look at that in the next slide. Um, but the final thing it needs to do is just stick that other public key in there to, so that the cloud can actually also get that shared key for the end-to-end -end encryption at some point. We'll send that over back to the hub. Uh, and the hub, again, it can't actually change this. It can read some parts, but it can't read the end-to-end -end encrypted data now because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, but it can verify whatever it can verify. I'll stick another tag on that and just say, okay, I'll verify this. This checks out. I trust this node that is sending the data back. I'll send that package up to the cloud. And now the cloud gets that. 
The cloud can verify the whole thing if it likes, or just tr trust the tag that the hub has provided. And if it's happy with everything, it'll just get that exchange key that it had for originally, get the public key from the message from the node, and generate that shared key, decrypt the data, and do whatever it's supposed to do. So there's a lot of things going on, maybe application-based, but from a Dyn perspective, this is the steps in this scenario that would uh, need to happen to keep this really secure. Uh, so about that link, so we take that original request uh, and we want to link this to a response that we're going to generate. So it's, it's not that difficult. We just grab a few things from this original message, which is the item header. So in this case, MSG. So we saw ID, ID for identities before. This now is it, just an MSG. So this kind of just tells whoever's going to verify this what the type of message is, uh, it is. And then is the unique identifier, which is a GUID, uh, which is unique for this message. And then there is a, a thumbprint, a secure hash of the whole message. And these three things are concatenated together into a string and forms the basis of an item link. So it gives a lot of information to the application of, okay, it's the message we're talking about, this is the specific GUID, and here's a hash of it. Uh, and then if you remember that the node signed its response coming back, so if we sign it as well, then of course it's integrity protected, and we created a strong cryptographic link to the request, the original request in the response. Uh, Sounds like a lot of work, but in Dime, that's actually one line of code. Uh, so on the line three here, the node message adds an item link, which is the cloud message that it got from the cloud. And that's actually creating this on top uh, and includes that on the message. Of course, there's a lot of things going on, like things above there, and there's a hash being generated. But using the reference implementation, that's all you do. Uh, and then when the, the cloud gets this, it can do verify linked items on it, or it can stick a list of potential uh, items that should be verified with. And it's looking for this integrity state valid item links. And if that comes out, it has verified the string out there to be correct. Uh, you can call verify it as well, then it will verify everything at once, but this is just specific for linked items. Um, so, there's always some problem somewhere. Uh, PKIs have their own. And this problem here is really about time. So we have the same scenario. So both sides is running a system time on their own. Uh, they may be uh, time synced with a time server, as they should be. But that doesn't mean they're running the exact same time. So there will be some differences. Uh, and when we start sending instant messages to all these different nodes, then, and we verify that down to a millisecond, it can be a problem. So in this case, I'm just going to talk about the seconds to keep it simple. So the cloud is running 16 seconds, whereas the hub is running 14 seconds. So it means the hub is actually two seconds behind the cloud. Uh, so the cl cloud creates a message, and that gets an issued at date in, uh, burned into that, which is 16 seconds. And it sends that over to the hub, which receives it. If we assume there's a transfer time of one second, it receives it at 15 seconds. So when the, the hub now calls uh, verify on this, it will of course get an error message saying uh, integrity state failed use before issued which is really saying that this message from the point of view of the hub came from the future, which is, a, I guess that's a nice feat in itself, but it does have a boring technical explanation, which is basically that the times here are out of sync between the two different uh, devices. Um, now, there are a couple of solutions to this. In Windows servers, that can issue certificates, like a certificate authority or within a network. They have sold this, Microsoft, Microsoft has sold this, but then uh, they've done a workaround basically. So when they issue certificates, 
they issue them 10, 15 minutes back in time. So when the receiver gets it, they can start using it directly. So that's what I would call a workaround. It does work, but it's a little bit more complicated when you send instant messages between applications. So uh, the DARM format doesn't solve this in itself, but the reference implementations, they have tools to help with that. And one of them is uh, grace period. So you can set the grace period, and this case is set to two. That means you're setting a grace period of two seconds. Uh, so you create a window of error margin, which is uh, a total of four seconds. So minus two seconds and plus two seconds. So when the hub now receives it at 15 seconds, it will have a window, which is from 13 seconds to 17 seconds. So the issue that data 16 seconds fits that window. Uh, so when it now does verifying it, it will actually get integrity state complete instead. So this is just one way of handling those small time differences between different devices. Um, so finally, and this is very important to understand because these are, these are things that we don't generally have to care about when we build applications. We, we, we sort of rely on the underlying infrastructure, but digital trust is not earned. We just get a public key and then we'll, you know, include that into our application's trust chain. But once we've done that, it's, it's just sealed by a cryptographic algorithm and we trust it blindly. There's, there's no earning to that. It could be verified, but it's given really. As so we give trust to our application rather than they earning it. So this is something we need to consider when we build this. Um, that's pretty much everything, just as an introduction on uh, application-based public key infrastructure using DIME. Uh, if you have some, re some reason want to you know, talk to me later or get in contact, my details are there. Uh, there's also a URL there, which is actually to the specification of the DIME format itself, which in turn has um, links to reference implementations. So if that's of interest, you can go there. Uh, I do, we have a lot of time, I see, uh, for questions. Uh, and I have t-shirts here, same ones that I have on me. Uh, and anyone who has a question will get a t-shirt. So you better think hard now. There's a different sizes there, so I guess you're gonna have to fight for that. Um, but it has to be relevant. It has to be a PKI or, or a, a dime-related question. So the question you can't ask, well, you can, of course, is how, you how I pronounce my surname. And it's a very good question, but it's not going to earn you a t-shirt, though. So, thank you. So, any questions? Where do you have Dime implemented today? Is it in use anywhere? Um, I, I don't think it's in production anywhere right now, but it is on its way. Uh, I, the one thing with open source is that you have less control and you know visibility of who's using it. But I do know, know of a case of um, a financial institution in Asia that is building it into a, uh, a, a two-factor uh, application. So it's, it's using it to uh, do device binding and sending secure messages between uh, customers in the bank and so forth. So, yeah. Is there a word like top secret on that or are they gonna do a case study or? I have no idea actually. Uh, <laughs> I don't know the level. I, I, I think it's not top secret. Um, yeah. So it's, it's uh, I know they're not done. Um, banks take a little bit longer than most other companies. So I'm not sure when but it's, it's pretty mature, so it, it may be out shortly, actually. So there could be any other project. I, I don't have sort of statistics for who's using it. It'd be nice to know if there's like any big projects or things like that's using it. I guess that's the nature of open source sometimes is that you don't know who's using it. How do you, how do you, how do you monitor expiration? And if you have the expiration like one year, for example? Yeah. 
I guess I, I, can, I can make this talk two hours or three hours because there's so many things with PKI and, and you know, app developers are, are, are spared those problems usually. But of course, if we start to move up a PKI into an application, we, we will run into those as well. There's a couple of good and bad solutions for it. One of them, which I have seen being used, is that we don't expire. You know, we'll just run with it. It's fine. We, we create the trust and we go with it. That's fine. Uh, if that's good or bad, it really depends. Uh, if you're using it to authenticate users and things, then maybe it's bad. If you're using it for some other reason, you just have some sort of, okay, these are unique devices. Maybe it's not as bad. Uh, but at some point, you're going to run into revocation uh, together with expiration. So you want to have rotation, you want to have a life cycle, and all those things is going to come in at some point. Uh, and those are not that easy to solve. And unfortunately, things like this don't solve it for you. They may even introduce it to you, depending on how, the way you're looking at it. But it, it, it comes with this type of solutions. PKIs have been around for a long time, but they still struggle with it with, on, on a low level with certificates and the whole X509 and, and those standards. It's not very easy. Um, it really depends on your application. If your application is based on, on like a, a mobile app that's gonna be used sometimes, you know, you may, not hit a, a time where you actually can rotate it because next time you hit it, it's expired. So you need to take those decisions. You need to figure out how to handle them. Uh, and and that, that could be a follow-up talk maybe or something because they, it is really interesting. There's so many good and bad solutions for that. Um, but I, I, from my point of view, the security benefits of actually using something like this actually overweights the negative sides where you actually have to handle expirations and rotations and people losing their, their private keys and you have to revoke them and things like that. So um, you do get better security, but with that, I guess you get a little bit more problems sometimes. You all happy? No more questions? Yeah. So, like, say, um, say you're using a, well, you said the uh, choice of cryptographic, cryptographic hashes and algorithms is kind of built in to it. Say it was using one and it was found to be terrible. Like, what, yeah. what happens in that? Yeah, well, that's, that's a common fear of everything, isn't it? Uh, I mean, that, there's, I think it's on that OWASP as well, that you know, you're just using old stuff that is not considered secure anymore. Um, and that is always a risk. Um, but the way I see it in this case is that, and, and I think that's the strength of open source, and there's a filtration to that, of course, but you are kind of piggybacking on other people's work and hopefully those other people actually know what they're doing and that's really what you're trying to get here is to use expertise from somewhere else and fill whatever uh, skills that you may be lacking or, or the developers are lacking and but it could happen it could be all, all of a sudden it turns out that SHA-1 wasn't actually the fantastic uh, hashing that, that it was supposed to be. You just realize that, or MD5, same thing. Or, or DES, you know, that, that was considered to be really secure until it wasn't. So it happens. Um, but the interesting thing here is that Dime works in suites, and those suites are compiled of, of you know, with certain, certain uh, those, all those algorithms work well together, they're considered secure, but there could be something in them. So what would happen if there was some sort of vulnerability that couldn't actually just be patched, it has to change the algorithms, then you would probably have to deprecate that suite and introduce another suite. So if I just go back many slides, I'll just show you a little indication of how it works because there was there blatantly on the screen 
I should have used the mouse because that would be quicker. I think it's. <laughs> oh, did I pass it? No, there it is. Okay. So you see, there is actually three word, uh, three uh, characters there. It says DC, uh, DC, uh, DSC. Uh, it just stands for Dime Standard. Uh, uh, it should actually be DCS, I think. Dime Cryptography is, is no Standard Cryptography is sweet. I think it is. Uh, so this basically just specifies that this particular public key belongs to a certain suite. So you can have multiple suites. Uh, now there's only one, but then the implementation of Dime would actually recognize, okay, this key is of this suite, so I'm going to use these algorithms. Uh, and the one I haven't shown here is that this, this base64 down here, which is the signature, is not actually just the signature. There's a couple of information in here as well, including which suite was used to generate it. Uh, also, there are um, a public, uh, an identifier based on the public key that actually points back to the public key. So you could see on these signatures which key was used as well. So there's more information in here that I didn't include. Uh, so all these things would help. It's not going to make things better when something happens, but it will help to try to mitigate and migrate to something that is at that point, more uh, considered secure. Good. Yeah, yeah. How easy, how easy would it be to implement a custom suite? So let's say I have a mandate to use specific uh, cryptography, cryptographic algorithm, let's say, for signature. Uh, I would say it's pretty easy. Um, so the suite it's using now is the sodium suite, really. Um, the suite that may be missing is depends on, on, on what kind of regulations and things like that are like the standard suite, like AES and, and um, using maybe, now it's using uh, AD25519 uh, as the lifted curve, which is becoming more and more popular, but there are NSA uh, specified curves that may, you may need to have to use. So if you wanted to do a, your own suite, it's a plug and play thing uh, where there is an interface. Well, I'm not, now I'm just talking about the reference implementation because the DIME data format doesn't really care about this, but the reference implementation has a interface uh, which represents cryptographic operations. And then you register them on startup and saying, I have these. And then you can either specify default one or you can specify one at that particular time when you need to use it. And that, then you're going to have a short for that, whatever that could be NSA. I don't know if that's a good short, but it could be that. And it would say that up there uh, instead. And that's how it would recognize it. And if it doesn't have it, there's going to be an exception thrown saying, I can't handle this. Uh, but it, it is really built to be expandable in that way. So it, it should not be too much of a problem doing that.